If you are in the market for a new car, doubtless you are watching road tests incessantly. And there's only one problem with those road tests, isn't there? They suck. And I bet you haven't figured out why. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Australia only. Website. Card. Now, I find it perverse slash hilarious that commentary in the comments feed from the nutbag fringe at times informs a discussion about something that is actually really, really important. And we'll get to that in just a sec. This video is sponsored by Olight. Sales starting at 8pm Wednesday the 26th of October, ending Friday at midnight. I'll have specific new Olights for you a little later in the week, but first, Christmas. Let's get a bit Baden-Powell on this, dude. Your wife deeply desires a full-sized Odeance multi-use work light, splash-proof and bi-colour, so she's going to be just as comfortable barbecuing in the rain on warm as she will be excavating your new fat cave on cool. 3,000 lumens and USB-C rechargeable. Nothing says I love you quite like a full-sized quality work light. And get yourself a cheeky swivel while you're down there. Swivel is a pocket-sized torch and a work light. Magnetic base, multi-angle, plus you can hang it. Great for the car and cheaper than your wife's new audience. Hashtag priorities. Now, if zombie slaying is more your thing, get the Warrior 3S. It's a lightsaber. It's been drop tested and it's waterproof. There's a tail switch for fast deployment, but there's also a side switch with different brightness modes when you're not slaying the undead. If there is an inconvenient infestation of undead at your place, however, and Jim's zombie slayers are off for the holidays, you're going to be okay. Finally, my favourite Olight, the Warrior Mini 2, which I carry with me every damn day. You could probably kill a zombie or even two with one of these, except they're already dead. It's bright, versatile and tough, kind of like you, dude. And chicks certainly appreciate a man with a Warrior Mini 2 sized bulge in his trousers. It's reassuring for all concerned, even if you don't get to deploy it quite as often as you might like. I carry one with me every day and it has been most satisfying indeed. Thanks so much for asking. Link in the description, sale starts Wednesday, code for 12% off outside the sale. Also, your lovely wife is going to be most surprised by that audience, dude. Do tell her it was my idea, if you know what's good for you. Now, let us try and turn the frown of critical feedback into some worthwhile discussion about why road tests actually suck. This is a multi-parter, a comment recently from a dude who chose to call himself Max from Sydney One. All one word. Very creative, Max from Sydney One. Can you at least drive the ePower X-Trail before you condemn it? No, Max, I can't because they're not on sale yet. And the only dudes in Australia who have, flew as guests of Nissan to Europe, Slovenia, I think. So they went business class, five star, ate lots of food, did the rock star thing, and usually didn't disclaim it in their reviews, which is kind of a little bit rough when it comes to you, the consumer, I'd suggest. So no, I can't do that. Nissan would never invite me. If they did, I wouldn't go. So you think the battery is too small for spirited driving? Yep, I do. It's ridiculously small. Okay, show us on a racetrack how this design floor is exposed. Family SUV weighing nearly two tonnes on a racetrack. Good concept, Max from Sydney 1. Should be good for about one, maybe two laps at the most. I'm speculating, yes, only guessing, that it will run out of brakes before it runs out of battery power on a track. Probably, but who cares what it runs out of first on a track. Most people who buy family SUVs have no expectation of ever taking them to a track day or doing anything of that nature, driving anything like that hard. This vehicle has a tiny battery and it does 
a lot of work. There is no getting around that. It's like Mr. Puniverse connected to a huge motor. It discharges itself extremely rapidly. That's not good. Track driving is completely irrelevant to family SUVs. Maximum Sydney one. We know the system power output of this vehicle, it is 157 kilowatts, right? The internal combustion engine in that vehicle makes 116 kilowatts. These are facts, okay? You don't need to road test the car to know this. They're in the spec sheet, they're facts. We know that they're relying on a 1.9 kilowatt hour battery to make up the difference between that 116 kilowatt combustion engine and the 157 kilowatt total system power. That's a tiny battery doing a big job when maximum demand is requested by the driver. That's a fact. Therefore, we know that battery is going to become depleted quickly if the driver demands a lot of performance from that vehicle without sufficient intervening time to recharge it because physics. That's how this kind of thing works. Okay, if I ring Nissan and request a car to take on track to further reinforce my position that it's emphatically a crap design, what do you think they're going to say, Max from Sydney 1? I don't blame them, and I'm not going to ring them and ask that because it's a pretty redundant exercise. We don't need to test that. They're not available, and you can't drive one now in any case. But I'm never taking a Nissan X-Trail to a racetrack to appease you, Max from Sydney 1, but I will entertain the rest of your comment for our edification. I suspect the only primary flaw of e-power is that it just isn't as fuel efficient as the Toyota hybrid system like every other manufacturer's system. Toyota don't get the credit they deserve. It's Toyota doesn't, Max from Sydney 1. Come on. Companies are singular entities, therefore... Toyota doesn't. I want to talk to you about a really grown-up concept here, okay? This is kind of important if you want to understand reality. And I guess one of our challenges every day is like, dude, you wake up and you've got to orient yourself to reality, right? So you've got two things. You've got what exists and what claims can we make about its existence. That's called ontology, right? And we've got what we know. The theory of knowledge. That's called epistemology and how well we know it. And these things combined allow us to paint the landscape of reality onto our consciousness individually, right? So they're kind of important grown-up concepts. What exists and what do we know about it, right? And there are different modes of existence, like Mount Everest exists, and if you run nude through a paddock in the middle of the night and you break your ankle, you'll be in pain and that pain will exist. But the difference is the existence of that pain is completely subjective. You're the only one experiencing it because you were so stupid. Whereas Mount Everest kind of exists independently of the observer. It's just there. Okay. This is an important distinction because ontological objectiveness, like taking the observer and the relevance of the observer out of the equation is really important when you want to understand something like a car. There are facts, there are objective facts. Whereas when you watch a road test, you're really just getting subjectivity, aren't you? You're just getting, someone's explaining to you, I've never understood this, someone's explaining to you the trapezoidal pattern of the grill, <laughs> right? I love that. You've got eyes, you can fucking see that you don't need some dipshit to explain it. And they all do it. They waste so much time telling you that the hood curves down like this and the headlights wrap around. And I'm going, that's what the camera's for. You muppet. So there's that, right? And then there are claims about the comfort levels and the ride quality and things like that, which is also ontologically subjective. Is it not? Like some people's noisy car is someone else's... Eh, most ute owners don't really care about noise, vibration and harshness. If they did, they wouldn't own a freaking ute, would they? So there's kind of that as well. The most important thing for you, if you are buying a car, is how the facts integrate with how that vehicle is going to be used by you. Is it going to do a good job at this 
or that because you're going to put 50 grand on the table and it's unimportant to have someone tell you what they think about the grill. You can make your own determination about that. Okay, this is kind of where I'm coming from. Okay, we know a lot of data about this car. When Max from Sydney goes, uh, I suspect the only primary flaw of e power is that it just isn't as fuel efficient. You don't have to suspect that, dude. We know the data. Okay, Shitbox e power is 6.1 litres per 100 Ks against a laboratory standardised fuel economy test. RAV4, it's 4.8 litres per 100 Ks. The difference is 21%. The RAV4 is 21% more fuel efficient because Toyota did a better job at efficiency with the layout of the powertrain. It is unquestionably more efficient to do the, the bulk of the heavy lifting with an internal combustion conventional powertrain and then just do regenerative braking deriving assistance from a small motor and a small battery. The assistance is at times, right? And it's recovering energy that you would otherwise have lost during the braking process. Whereas this e-power system is going through multiple hoops to seem clever and actually be more than 20% less efficient than a RAV4 hybrid, okay? It's also more expensive and heavier than the RAV4 hybrid, both of which things are not the kinds of things consumers look for or engineers strive for when they're targeting efficiency. It's just not. E-Power is a dud design. It just is. If efficiency is the benchmark that you're after, E-Power is fucked. Sorry, that's a fact. It's not as good as a RAV4 hybrid powertrain, which is donkey's years old now. This is brand new. It's ridiculous. The RAV4, incidentally, is also 151 kilos lighter and it produces 6 kilowatts more power. So it's got a substantially better power-to-weight ratio. Ergo, it's going to go better. Aside from that, and dude, these are all facts, okay? e is a great idea. Aside from that. And I agree with Max from Sydney 1 also that Toyota doesn't get the credit it deserves because they haven't got nearly enough credit yet for being such greenwashing vandals, okay? They're terrible at that, greenwashing themselves. They got no hesitation, apparently, standing up in front of the press and declaring carbon is the enemy and we've got to decarbonize and get to carbon neutrality when they're talking about some shitbox Corolla hybrid, right? But when they're talking about SUVs and four-wheel drives and utes, Hiluxes, Land Cruisers, Klugers, Prados, whatever, they're there and they're talking about ruggedness and reliability and all of this stuff. The two are mutually exclusive, right? You can't build a 2.6-tonne big fat wagon with a 3.3-litre bi-turbo diesel engine and be committed to decarbonisation. Like, you just can't do that. So they are, at the very least bipolar okay they don't get enough enough credit for being unashamed liars either to consumers like according to the federal court of australia they lied to 260,000 people as in misrepresented the functionality of the dpf installation in the 2.8 liter diesel engine that powers the hilux fortuna and prado like and the other thing they don't get enough credit for, and they're really good at this, is they worship money. They really do. Toyota is a religion, like inside the building. Toyota's a religion and their God is money and they'll do anything to get yours. They will say anything to you to get yours. And they have frankly done a really good job brainwashing a bunch of people on this issue, in my view. Plenty of blue singlet Australians think that Toyota's the best. They haven't driven any other brand for like, I don't know, 20 years or something, but Toyota's the best, mate, I know. Max from Sydney 1 goes on and says, the upside, one word, upside, Max from Sydney 1, just saying, of the e-power X-Trail is that a customer might take delivery of it before they die of old age, unlike the Toyota RAV4. Well, 
You're speculating there, Max. We don't know anything about the availability of the X-Trail e-power or the Qashqai e-power. It could be great or it could be just as fucked as Toyota's hybrids do. Max from Sydney One goes on and says, Don't forget, John, your best YouTube video, in my opinion, was your terrific track review of the manual i30N. Can we see more reviews like that and less unproven online rock throwing? Unproven online rock throwing. Really? We'll get back to that, Max from Sydney One. Okay, so let's talk about facts because this is quite a grown up sort of conversation. Why don't I do more road tests? I want to talk to you about that i30N video, which I was quite pleased with. And I'm glad I'm pleased with it because it took so friggin' long to do. It's had 360,000 views. I looked it up the other day. And it's made me $2,000 worth of YouTube advertising revenue. And you might think, oh, that's great. Two grand for a video. He's rolling in it. They don't all make that, and they don't all get 360,000 views, okay? That was just a decent one, above average, absolutely. But And people liked it. It's had 52,000 hours of watch time in total since it was published. That's 2,200 uh, 2, days, which is about six years worth of watch time. So eyeballs actually on the glass teat looking at that review about six years. Slightly less, I think, but just a bee's dick less. It took me two days to, sorry, two days to write and plan and then two days to shoot. That was like a track day and a road day. And then it took me two days to cut. So that's six days, dude. And then it took me one day to faff about with the logistics. Like you've got to go and get the car and bring it back. And you've got to make sure it's got fuel in it when you're going out on the road test days. And you've got to detail it and stuff like that. So there's another day there. So seven days for two grand, okay? I did it for less than 300 bucks a day. Now, I don't know about you, dude, but that is not a business model. It's just not. And the other thing is, in your average seven workday period, I could easily do 10, 12 videos like this. And what would be ultimately more value to a consumer? I've got to ask myself and more value to me because I am not in this as a sort of desperate cry for acceptance and I'm not in it as a charity just here for you. I am doing it for you, but I'm also doing it for me as a business. I want customers for my car buying business and the pittance that I make from YouTube as ad revenue also helps. So there's that. Now, I'd suggest that I am not alone here, right? Publishers all have problems with the ROI of road testing for the reasons I just outlined, right? I, I should also suggest that I had to go out on location twice with, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 bucks worth of camera gear to do that. And I've also got to know how to edit all of that footage together and I've got to plan it. And the planning of that, like the directorial planning of that, how are we going to shoot this so it all cuts together? Because you don't shoot every bit sequentially. You don't start at the start and finish at the end. You shoot bits all over the place and it's got to stick itself together. And you'll be sitting there in the edit suite going, Jesus Christ, we're here and we're here and I can't see how to get from here to there. So that's a bit of a head scratcher when you forget to shoot something because you're kind of planning on the fly all the time, but I guess keeps your grey matter going, okay? Without advertising, publishers generally just... Road tests don't make sense, is what I'm saying, without advertising. So in addition to the problems that I face, your average publisher also has to pay extra for an editor and a camera crew, right? And then there's the inevitable disconnect between they booked them for that day and it rains and they didn't get the shots they want and they've got to change this and that and how long is the journo out of play for to do all of this stuff, right? The reviews, therefore, on most of these mainstream websites like Drive, for example, they're really only there as a prick tease to the advertiser to say, see how relevant we are to your fine product and therefore... You would be insane not to splash your beautiful advertising cash on us because we're here and we're fluffing. This is the set of a pornographic movie and we're fluffing every day. You might as well come on in and star, you know? And P.S. it's going to cost you this much in advertising sort of thing, right? 
a lot of car makers are also funding the reviews that you watch under the table and it's not being disclosed. And all of the gravy train type trips are not being disclosed. Well, mostly not being disclosed. There might be the odd disclaimer here and there in the fine print about blah, blah, travel to exotic location A, Rome, Paris, London, whatever, as a guest of insert car company name here to produce this review. So even if there's not a monetary exchange, that process of picking a tame journalist out of his chair, putting him in business class, accommodating him at a five-star hotel, whatever, and then getting him home and all of the other stuff because they do just trot out all of these money-can't-buy experiences, you know? They've got helicopters and, you know, I went to Spain for one night to drive the V10 Tuareg, believe it or not, all those years ago, and the helicopters picked us up and flew us back to Barcelona, and then we had a few hours and got our heads down briefly and got back on a plane. I felt like I'd been in the ring with Mike Tyson. It wasn't that much fun. The body clock shunt was immense, but... Can you imagine the cost of doing that? Business class to Barcelona, the big drive program, the press conference at some Swiss joint, the big expensive dinner, the hotel, the flight back for a review, okay? Now, you've got to ask yourself, what pressure is on the journalist and the publisher when a journalist attends that kind of event, which the ePower events were, as I understand it? So the pressure is to say only nice things. It's implicit, but... The publisher is incentivised for the review to be positive. The journalist is incentivised for the review to be positive. The spend of the car company to make that review happen is not disclosed, right? So you're in the dark over here watching this review that you think is impartial but really is anything but. And it's like a symbiotic relationship, the publisher and the car maker under the table. The car maker's got money, they feed it to the publisher. The publisher says nice things, makes the car maker happy to keep feeding, okay? Whereas I'm not like that. I put you first, and that's a big difference, right? And I'm not out there, I don't want to do a whole bunch of road tests because there's a whole bunch of facts that really matter. And the facts matter more than some waffling, airy-fairy bullshit by someone who wouldn't know shit from clay about the facts anyway. If you've got 60 grand to spend on a car, the facts really matter. The subjective whatever, you can get in the back at a dealership and assess the legroom. You can look at the cargo space for yourself. You can see if you like the hexagonal accents on the freaking grill. Dude, What you need to know is how this car stacks up objectively against its key competitors, what the car maker is like to be in bed with for three to five years, and things of that nature. And when it comes to the bad car makers in particular, there's a huge incentive on reviewers and publishers not to disclose any of that stuff to you. You go and have a look at a Jeep review or a Range Rover review, right, or Something of that nature. Mercedes-Benz is a classic for throwing punters under the bus. Journalists are all, you know, wetting their trousers over these cars, whereas you've got to live with it, right? And the live with it reality is so different to picking it up clean and then thrashing it for a week and taking it back dirty and empty, but importantly, saying principally nice things about it so the circle of life can fucking well continue, which I find disgraceful, not to mention a bit of a knee in the nuts for you, okay? And the other thing I'd suggest about all of this is that if what I'm doing here really is just, as Max from Sydney 1 alleges, a, quote, unproven... Bug, hate that. Unproven online... Kill something every day just to maintain operational proficiency, just saying. Unproven online rock throwing, if that's what this is, right, relying on facts to draw conclusions, then okay. But I'd suggest in the land of science and engineering and things of that nature where we use ontologically objective facts like gravity, okay, every time you use gravity to design something, which will be every time, you don't have to run an experiment because... Gravity is known in the context of how it affects the design of this clamp, whatever. 
So you don't need to do a road test on gravity. Gravity's known. And there's an epistemically objective theory of gravity, which is ontologically objective. That's what car reviews should be, and yet they're not. They're just so much fluff. I got another pro tip for you on this, okay? I was working this out this morning. Nissan has a very well-funded PR operation in Australia. There's more than one person on the team, and they have the funds to devote to things like media monitoring, which all car companies do, because they are all obsessed by what is said in the public domain about them, okay? Now, my comments so far on ePower have attracted about cumulative total 100,000 views. And they've been pretty long views too, like my average view duration on this channel is about 12 minutes, I think, currently. So they've had ample opportunity to call me and tell me where I've gone wrong in my objective assessment of that vehicle based on the facts. And guess what, dude? Deafening silence on that front. So if you don't mind, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing here because I see it as a point of difference and a real opportunity to provide a service that is not forthcoming anywhere else to the dude, perhaps like you, with 40, 50, 60, 70, whatever, thousand bucks on the table pontificating about this car or that car. If that is you and all your watching, reading, whatever, is gushing reviews, at least now you know why you're in such a living hell.